Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. Today we are offering a bountiful bouquet as we look at what it means to have a perfect flower. Jim Schreffler reminds us why we may have squash flowers but not be seeing any fruit just yet. I further explain the simple science of monoecious versus dioecious plants. And Becky Carroll shares with us the critical pollination stage of pecans. Today we've got another simple science segment coming your way and a lot of times we're walking through our garden and we're looking for the perfection that is in our garden and while as gardeners a lot of times we see the imperfection, we see those weeds that need to be pulled and things like that, we're not talking about the garden as a whole today, we're talking about the flowers specifically. Did you know that there are perfect and imperfect flowers? That's truly what they are called. But before we get into what is a perfect and imperfect flower, we first need to talk about the parts of a flower. And in order to do that, we're gonna use a simple lily here. Um, an Easter lily is a great way to do that. Now you can see I've got a stem of lilies here and this one got a little messy on us and I'm gonna explain what this is all about here. So we've got a lily, this is a complete flower, and this messy stuff is actually the pollen. Usually when florists get these and they start to open, they will pinch these off. You can see this one doesn't have any because this pollen will stain your clothes. So we're gonna first start by looking on the outside of the flower. And while these all look like petals, these outside ones are actually called sepals. You can see here on the ones that are still buds, these sepals are what protect the flower as it's developing. They initially start out very green, but as the flower matures and gets closer to blooming, you can see how they're starting to get a little bit wider until it's white. But you can see how it still has that kind of green spine to the back of it. Now these sepals open up um, and create a more floral display on the inside, inviting more insects to come inside. So we're gonna go ahead and tear this particular flower right here apart so that we can dissect all of these parts of the plant. So the first thing we're going to do is take our sepals and on this particular one we're going to find that there are three sepals. So we're going to go ahead and just pinch those off. One, two, and three. So we're going to lay those right there for us to see. Now you'll find that we also have three petals on here. Now it's a little hard to tell on these white ones, but a lot of times the petals will have kind of tracks and markings that are um, basically creating an invitation for your pollinators to come inside and to highlight where they need to land on their flower. So this one has sort of some bumpy marks to kind of um, entice them to come down into the body of this uh, flower here. So these are the petals. We're gonna now remove those three petals. Again, it's a little messy because it does have some pollen on there as well. One, two, and three petals. So next we have what we call the male part of the plant. And in this case, we have um, six of those and there are three parts to the male part of the flower. And I'm gonna go ahead and pull one of these off. So you've, this whole thing is called the stamen. And if you think about it, men is in the word stamen, so you know it's the male part of the plant. That is composed of the filament that holds 
the anther, and inside the anther is the pollen. And you'll notice that these filaments, they're barely attached to the anther, and that allows them to sort of dance in the wind. Again, if you think a bee comes in here and kind of is nestling around in there, um, then all of a sudden that pollen's gonna then get on the bee. So that's what this is all about. We've got six of those. I've already pulled one of those off. So we're gonna take one, two, three, four, and the fifth one here, and our sixth one there. So you can see these again are the stamen, the male part of the plant. And then finally we have one last part, and this is the female part of our flower here. So you can see there's like a swollen area here, and this is the ovary. Then you have your style, which is actually a tube from your sticky stigma up here. It's sticky so that the pollen will stick to it. The pollen travels down this tube into the ovary and that's how you get your seeds in all of your um, flowers that produce a fruit. So this basically is the whole female part. Again, it's all called the pistil, but comprised of the ovary, the style, and the stigma. So we're gonna go ahead and break this off too so that we've got all four parts that are necessary to have a complete flower. That's your sepals, your petals, your stamen, and your pistil. Now, if any one of these four parts is missing off of a flower, sometimes flowers don't have sepals or petals, then they are considered incomplete. If a plant has all four of them, they are complete. But the two most important parts of any flower are the sexual parts of that, which is the male and the female parts of the plant, because that's what, again, produces the seed, which is, in essence, what the plant is trying to do. So if you have a flower that is complete and has all of these, you know that it is also a perfect flower. It's sort of like that whole thing that a square is a rectangle, but not necessarily a rectangle is a square. There you have it. You now know what makes a perfect flower for your garden. Plants, uh, plants such as watermelon, pumpkin, and squash are all in a group of plants that we call cucurbits. Uh, it's, a, it's a family of plants that typically has separate male and female flowers. And in order for these plants to set fruit and develop fruit, they have to, have, have to be pollinated by insects as, such as honeybees and bumblebees and, and some other pollinators too. And that, that pollination requires that the insects move uh, from the, what, this is a female flower, so the insects need to go into the female flower where, where they pick up the pollen, from the male flower where they pick up pollen, and then they, then they fly around and they move to a female flower. Uh, and this is, one, this is one of those here, the flower is closed, but this is one of the female flowers, and this one has been pollinated, uh, which means that a, uh, when this flower was still open, one of those insects, uh, and probably several, went into that flower and deposited the pollen to, to enable the pollination to occur. So uh, it's, many times people don't, uh, don't uh, you, when you say the male and female flowers, they're, they're a little confused, but in, in, in all of these, uh, whether it's watermelon or, or squash or pumpkin, uh, it's pretty easy to distinguish the different flowers. The uh, male flowers are typically on a long, narrow stalk, not always this long, but on a, on a narrow stalk like this. Whereas the female flowers, the stalk is shorter that they're on, and, uh, and there's, even before the pollination occurs, the, at the base of the flower, there's a tiny, uh, the fruit, a very tiny version of the fruit is, is there invisible. So, so that, uh, that'll help you understand if your particular crop is setting, it has both male and female flowers. Sometimes what happens is you, you'll have some male flowers, in the, the female flowers are a little slower in, in, in developing, so, so people think, well, I've got flowers out there, but I'm not getting any fruit. It may be that your female flowers just have not started to open yet. So, so that might just be a little pointer that will help you when you're growing your cucurbit crops.
So we've talked about imperfect and perfect flowers. Remember, perfect flowers have both the male and the female parts in one flower. Imperfect means that they're missing either the male or female, which means you possibly have two different types of flowers. Now, how do you know whether you're getting a male plant or a female plant? Well, before we get to that, it might mean that you have two different types of flowers on one plant. If you have both male and female flowers on a single plant, that is called monoecious. Monoecious is Greek for meaning one house, mono meaning one. So you have all of the sex organs in one plant. Now, there are plants, and like I said, like the lily is like that, but an example of an imperfect flower where you have a plant that has two different types of flowers on it would be your traditional corn. Think about it. Where are the flowers on the corn plant? Well, a lot of people might suggest that the flowers are the tassels that are at the top of the corn plant, and you would be correct. Those are actually the male flowers. If you think about it, the male flowers is up high, and so those tassels contain the pollen. They have the filaments that release the um, pollen off of those anthers up there, and the gravity and the wind allow that pollen to fall down to the female flowers that are on the side of the corn stalks. And if you've ever shucked corn, you know how sticky it can be messing with all of those silks. So those silks are actually the sticky stigmas that we mentioned that the pollen has to fall down onto those stigmas. And each one of these corn silks leads to a kernel of corn. So kind of gives you a little perspective next time you're eating some corn on the cob and you notice one of those kernels isn't actually developed. That's because one of those silks that led to that kernel didn't ever get any pollen in order for that to ripen up. So that is an example of a monoecious plant with imperfect flowers. Now, what about the dioecious? plants. Dioecious means two house. So you have a female plant and a male plant, but how would you ever know whether it's a female or a male plant? Well, there are several examples of dioecious plants, including our eastern red cedars, ginkgos, asparagus. Those are all dioecious plants. So here I have um, a couple of eastern red cedars. If you take a look at this, now we all know eastern red cedars, they cause a lot of allergy problems, and that is because of the pollen from the male plants. They're actually produced um, out of cones. So you can see here, there's a male plant here that has these little brown cones on the end, they kind of turn orange, and they will release that pollen um, early in the season. But it is the female plant that produces these berries. Once um, the pollen lands on it and they begin to ripen, you get these bluish berries, which might be attractive um, in a landscape if you want. Cedar waxwings actually really enjoy eating these berries, but it's also these berries that then get later spread around and cause the eastern red cedar um, to develop in some other places. Now it is a native plant, so that's the eastern red cedar being dioecious, and a lot of your junipers are. Now here we have a holly. Not all hollies are dioecious, but some are, including the deciduous holly. And you can see this is a female because it actually has berries that are being produced on it. So why does it matter whether your plant is dioecious or not? Well, let's say you go and you want to landscape the front of your house with hollies that have berries on them. If you got male plants, you would have some plants that never have berries on them no matter what. It might be that you walk into the nursery and buy a female plant because it has berries on it, you get it home, and the next year it never produces any berries. That's because you might live in an area where there are no male hollies around to actually pollinate um, those female plants. So while you might have a female, it won't actually produce any of those berries for you. Now in most urban areas, you don't really have to worry about that because there's usually plenty of hollies around the vicinity. However, if you want to make sure that you do have both male and female, if you live out in the country or you want to make sure that you have berries that are able to produce, then you want to make sure you have one of both, at least one male. You don't have to have a one for one ratio. And the male could be in the backyard um, and you could have all berries in the front yard if you wanted to do that. 
Well, it might get complicated. Like, do I have to look for the flowers in order to buy the right hollies that I need? Luckily, the horticulture industry is there to help you out with different cultivar names that will kind of guide you as to what you might be buying, such as Blue Prince and Blue Princess, China Boy or China Girl. And in some cases, they've actually put the male and the female in the same pot, and they call that China Twins. So there you have it. It's sometimes made easy. If you look at the name, it often is a clue as to whether it might be a female or a male plant. Now, you might think, I should always want fruit, right? I always want the female plant, but that might not always be the case. Take, for instance, our Kentucky coffee tree. It's a native tree. It's a beautiful tree that has an open, airy canopy and produces these large, almost up to 12-inch long bean pods. Now, some people like those because of the ornamentation that they provide on the tree. However, if you have to be in an area where you want to make sure you're mowing under it, Having to mow over and around hundreds of 10 inch long seed pods can be a little damaging to your mower. So in that instance, if you have a dioecious tree like a Kentucky coffee tree, you might want to make sure that you're getting the male cultivar instead of the female. Again, the female would have the fruits, the males would not. So if you didn't want to contend with the mess of a female Kentucky coffee tree, you might look for a cultivar called Espresso, which is a male cultivar of that type of tree. Now another tree that you want to avoid getting the female is on is the ginkgo. Ginkgos are notorious, female ginkgos I should say, are notorious for having vomit-like smelling fruit. So probably something that you don't really want in your front yard, but ginkgos have a unique distinctive look as they have a fan-shaped leaf and they're a very attractive tree. So you might want to go with the male cultivar instead of the female when it comes to the ginkgo tree. So there you have it, reasons why you might want to be aware of whether that plant you're adding to your landscape is monaceous or dioecious. Today we are back out here at the Cimarron Valley Research Station and we are standing in the pecan orchard and some might say we're standing in a field of flowers but Becky I don't see any flowers can you help me out here? <laughs> There's flowers everywhere if you take a look into these trees if we'll pull down this branch right here all these um, things that are hanging down uh -huh. these are called catkins they're the male flowers. Okay. And then the female flowers are a little bit harder to see, but they're at the end of the current season's growth. That's the female flower or the pistillate flower. So that kind of bright limey green color. Yep. Is There's where... just little, um, little stigmas that are exposed right there. And just recently, since um, probably Monday, these started to be visible where you can see them. Okay, so all the male pollen has to find its way onto that female pollen yep. in order to get our pecans each season, correct? Yes, and so we wanna have our pollen source within about 150 yards of the tree that we're wanting to be pollinated. Okay. So if you're planting trees, you need to make sure that they're planted close enough, unless you're around native trees, where they might have a pollen source that might uh, come in. But still, about 150 yards is ideal. Okay, well, I know people that just maybe have one pecan tree in their mm -hmm. backyard, and if it's got the male and the female, why does that not work? Why yeah. do we need something different? Pecans are kind of different. They are, they're a monoecious plant, so they have male and female flowers on the same tree. So monoecious means, I think, same house or, mm -hmm. or something like that. And so we have both the male and female flowers, but they are a little bit different than things like peach or apple where we have a complete flower. Right. These are separate flowers. And so, um, and the thing about pecans is that they have dichogamous flowering where the, the, uh, the male flowers and the female flowers, they are not sexually mature at the same time. Oh. So the female flowers may be receptive before the male flowers, which that would be a protogenous type of of a uh, flower. And so I always think of protogenous, it has gin in the middle, so Jenny, 
the female flowers are receptive first. And then if the male flowers are sending out pollen before the females are receptive, those are called protandrous. And so I think of Andy or Andrew in the middle. And so the male flowers are sending out pollen before the females are ready to be pollinated. Okay, so you want one of both if you've got yes. pecans so that they can make sure that you've got pollen when the females are ready yep. and vice versa. Yes, you wanna have an early pollen shed and a late pollen shed. Sometimes they're called type one and type two. Okay. Uh, sometimes protandrous and protogenous so it's kind of a mouthful there uh -huh. but uh, you need one of each okay. and to get a good fruit set so is this more important on cultivars because i know cultivars are you know genetically all the same right if you right. get one particular cultivar right. the next one over is exactly the same that's right so when we're when we're laying out an orchard mm -hmm. in a in a commercial setting we want to have about every fourth row as a as a pollinator oh. and so we want to make sure that we're setting that up properly during the planting time and then also think about way down the road when we're thinning the orchard that we're not going to be removing all the pollinators in year 20 or so okay so you have to set it up properly yeah because initially an orchard is over planted right, right? but right. then as those trees grow you have to go out and you thin out thin some them. of your trees right. in a native grove each native tree is genetically different. So you're gonna have good pollination uh, with, with those trees. They're gonna be protanerous and protogenous out in that same area. All right, so that's one of the benefits of having right. a native tree over right. a cultivar. Sure. Okay, well, it's, it's, you've thrown a lot of fancy words at us <laughs> during this I know, segment. I know. But it is interesting to know. And of course, the female flowers are out on the end. And so right. you can see we have these shucks here. So that's where we're going to find our pecans later in the season, also. Right. And whenever we start um, getting, you know, pecans are one of the last things to start budding out in the spring. Uh -huh. You can always tell a pecan orchard or you're driving down the road and you see a native grove because they're very late to start breaking bud. And, um, but whenever they start breaking or opening up those buds, the catkins will be uh, developing on that last year's wood. Okay. And so we'll have catkin development and the shoot development on last year's wood, which is right here. Uh -huh. And so you can see they're all coming directly off of that last year's growth. It's got kind of that grayer bark to mm -hmm. it, right? And that current season's growth is going to be, um, it, it'll have primary buds. We can't see them right now. But when this gets to be mature, we'll be able to see primary buds. And then the female flowers, they are born on the current season's growth. So we'll have this new shoot development, and this is where the female flowers are developed. So the catkins are directly on last year's growth, and the female flowers are on this year's growth. So a little bit different. And these are usually not visible until early May, but you can pull your limbs down and see if there's a potential crop even early before they're pollinated. Now, even if you see flowers, that doesn't mean we may, we'll have pecans in the fall because a lot of things can happen between now and um, October or November when we're harvesting. But you can, you can also check when you're, uh, to see if your pollen source is active just by shaking some of these tassels uh -huh. and seeing some of that yellow pollen being released or looking at your flowers and they'll get kind of a sticky substance on there okay. and that's just signaling that they are ready to be pollinated. Okay and they are wind pollinated? Is they that are correct? wind pollinated yes uh, insects are not involved in the in the uh, pollination and so if we if we have um, a tree that doesn't have a pollen source it's just out there by itself it may have flowers but it doesn't get pollinated or it may be self-pollinated there are some that will actually pollinate themselves but they'll lose maybe three quarters of that crop and the quality is not as good. Okay. So uh, we would rather have cross pollination if possible. Some trees won't pollinate each other the, the same or themselves uh -huh. at all, but others may have a, a slight window where they can pollinate each other. Okay, so unless you have native, you definitely want to get yep. more than one yep. um, different types. And if these don't pollinate properly, mm -hmm. we'll have a lot of pecans dropping on the ground in June. And so we watch for June drop, and that's usually there was some problem with our pollination at that time. Okay. So they didn't get fertilized, and they dropped to the ground. All right. Well, thanks for sharing this information sure. with us, Becky. And sure. definitely, we are in a field of flowers. Oh, definitely. And I know why my eyes are starting to water now. <laughs> Thank you, Becky. Sure. <laughs> There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year, 
Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. Next week, we've got another great Oklahoma gardening show as we cover everything from butterflies to birds. It's close. You're not too far. <laughs> you can't eat these flowers. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Tulsa Garden Center at Woodward Park, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, Smart Pot, and the Tulsa Garden Club. <laughs>